Okay, so this is a special message. We're taking a break from our uh, study through Isaiah for Mother's Day. This is one of the few Sundays of the year where I actually do a separate themed message that's not related to Christmas or Easter um, or, or the text that we're studying here through our expository study here on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. So this is a topical study for Mother's Day. And we're going to start in Matthew chapter 15. If you'd like to open up your Bibles there, Matthew chapter 15. And I've entitled this message, Prevailing in Prayer. Prevailing in Prayer. And specifically, it is a mother who is interceding, coming to Jesus and interceding for her demon-possessed daughter. So really, it's a, it's a mom's prayer for her daughter here that we look at. Matthew 15, and we'll read verses 21 to 28. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, by way of introduction, today we are focused on moms, and we're focused on Mother's Day, uh, and so this, this really is a message for the moms, but of course it's the Word of God, so it applies to all of us, and so, uh, but the, the focus here is a mom who is interceding for her daughter. She's demon-possessed. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Um, The influence and the impact that a mom has on her children, uh, in in a very real sense, uh, influences the world. And so uh, a mother has such an influence in the life of her children, in the life of her child, uh, it is just something that cannot be overstated or overemphasized. It is a God-given role to where women have this influence over the next generation of humanity, every generation. And so uh, it's no wonder that the devil is against uh, the family, the devil is against the home, he's against the marriage, he's against women. And a lot of times it's single women now who are raising the children all by themselves, trying to wear several different hats and you know keep a whole bunch of uh, uh, balls in the air juggling while they are also trying to uh, be a, a godly Christian woman and have their own relationship with the Lord, and yet they're having to do the job of mom and dad. And so uh, it, it is truly a cherished role, the, the role of motherhood. Uh, it is an honored role in the Bible and throughout uh, history. I want to read a little poem to you uh, just kind of to give you uh, an idea of the impact that a mom has. This is from William Ross Wallace. It's just the last two stanzas of this poem, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Many of you have heard this before. Women, how divine your mission here upon our natal sod. Keep, O oh, keep the young heart open always to the breath of God. All true trophies of the ages are from mother love impearled for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Blessings on the hand of women, fathers, sons, and daughters cry, and the sacred song is mingled with the worship of the sky, mingled where no tempest darkens, rainbows evermore are curled, for the hand that rocks the cradle 
is the hand that rules the world. And so the impact that a mother has over her child is, is just massive. It, it, is, it is something that we really can't even fathom. And so it is no wonder that the enemy is attacking the women uh, so fiercely in our culture, even getting them to question what a woman is or what a woman's role is or to make it seem like being a mom is something less than or something that is not to be uh, desired and it's better to go and get you know uh, a doctorate in college or to go and become a president and CEO of a company now maybe that's fine maybe that's what you want to do is get your doctorate in college as a woman uh, or be a president and CEO of a company there's nothing wrong with that but uh, being a mom and being able to raise children especially a stay-at-home mom uh, where the kids have somebody there that they always know that their mom is there for them she's helping them to get out in the morning and she's there uh, when they get back uh, from school to help them with their, their homework and with their day. Uh, it, it, it can't be overstated the impact that that woman has upon her children and the challenges uh, that are here in our culture, again, uh, for the single moms who don't have that ability. But society uh, looks down on this. Society puts down a mother who wants to be a mother, who wants to be a homemaker as though that's less than or that's lesser than something else. And that's such a lie uh, from the pit of hell. There's no greater calling than for a mom to raise her children uh, in the fear and the admonition of the, uh, of the Lord and to impact and influence the following generation for Christ. Uh, Proverbs is the book of wisdom, and before we get into the story there uh, of the woman prevailing in prayer, I just want to share some of the Proverbs with you about the uh, perspective of the book of wisdom toward mothers and the, the role that mothers have and the influence that mothers have over their children and the response that, that people and children especially should have toward the instruction of their moms. Let me just read these verses to you here quickly. In Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, we read this. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. For they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. So notice here, it's not just the father's instruction, but it is the mother's instruction as well, given to the child. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 20, we read this. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. And so the book of wisdom here, speaking to the son, and this would have been to the future king, of Israel, Solomon writing to his son Rehoboam, who would go on to be the king of Judah, uh, and he's saying, listen uh, to your father's command and do not forsake the teachings of your mother or the law of your mother. And then he says, why? He says, uh, when you roam, they're going to bring you back. When you sleep, they're going to watch over you. When you awake, they will speak with you. And so the uh, wisdom uh, that a godly mother has and the influence over her children, children will be wise to listen to the wisdom and the instruction of their mothers. In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Indeed, how true that is, how a mother's heart can be broken uh, by the bad choices of uh, her children. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 20, we read, a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. So again, this is instruction and wisdom. So if you are a wise man or you are a wise woman, uh, you will not despise your mother. He says a foolish man despises his mother. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 26, we read this. Cease, or rather, he who mistreats his father... Proverbs 19, 26, and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words 
of knowledge. So again, those who would mistreat their father and chase away their mother will bring shame, cause shame and bring reproach. And if you stop listening to instruction, you will stray from the words of knowledge. Again, this is speaking to the child. In Proverbs 23 and verse 22, listen to your father who begot you and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise child will delight in him. Verse 25, let your father and your mother be glad, and let her who bore you rejoice. And so again, this is to the child. This is to the son or the daughter, the one who has been instructed in wisdom and uh, basically telling uh, you to listen to your father. Don't despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and sell it not. In Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 24, we read this. Whoever robs his father or his mother and says it is no transgression, the same is companion to a destroyer. And so uh, someone who would say, well, uh, it's all mine anyways. What belongs to my parents is going to belong to me. And so they, they take what doesn't belong to them and say, well, this is my early inheritance. Uh, he's saying, no, that's robbery. That's, that's, that, that's a thievery. Uh, and it is a transgression. And it is wrong. And it is those who would be a companion to uh, a destroyer. In Proverbs 29, 15, we read this. The rod and rebuke give wisdom. So that's disciplining your children. But a child left to himself or to herself brings his mother to shame. And how true that is when you, you talk to the moms of the kids that are in juvenile hall or the, the young men who are locked up because of gangs or drugs or violent crime or whatever, oftentimes raised by single moms. The single moms are out there working you know, uh, 40, 50, 60 hours a week to make ends meet. And the kids are being raised by the school system and then they're being raised by their peers and they're being raised on the streets. And what a heartbreak for the mother to have to go to court and to watch their son or their daughter uh, have to stand before a judge and go to jail or go to prison for some indiscretion or some crime that they have committed. Uh, it just breaks uh, a mom's heart far more than a dad. You often see that there's a mom there in court when somebody's being sentenced even to a life in prison or 20 years for a violent crime, the moms are usually there crying and weeping with their child, their grown child, and, and oftentimes the dads are not there. But the moms, their hearts are so tied to their children uh, that uh, a child that's left to himself will bring his mother to shame. In Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 11, we read about a generation that I think is very similar to our generation, perhaps even speaking about our, our generation today. There is a generation, Proverbs 30, 11, that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet it is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives, to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. So speaking about a godless generation, a wicked generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. In other words, has no gratitude or thankfulness for even those who brought them into the world, gave them life as it were, uh, pure in their own eyes, yet not washed from their filthiness. Uh, a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Paul told Timothy about this same generation, I believe. The pride, their eyes lifted up, their eyelids lifted up, their teeth are like weapons, their words are like weapons to hurt and to uh, destroy. And this is the generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. Very similar to what I see uh, happening all around us in our culture today. In Proverbs 31 and verse 1, we read this. The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. What, my son, and what son of my womb, and what son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. This is the advice of a mother to her son who's going to be a king. A son who's a prince that's going to end up becoming the king. This is the advice the mom is giving him. 
Likely it's Bathsheba giving the advice to her son Solomon who wrote this. Verse 4, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and they pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open your mouth for the speechless, in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. So this is the instruction of a mom to her son, who's a prince, who's going to become one day a king. Sober-minded, not uh, consumed with intoxicating drink or drugs and alcohol and, and, and partying, perverting justice, chasing after women. Uh, uh, he's, in, 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 instead, she says, open your mouth for those who don't have a voice. Open your mouth for the speechless. Uh, open your mouth for the cause of those who are appointed to die. Judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. This is a godly mom giving godly advice and instruction to her child. And then we read in verse 10 about the virtuous woman, the virtuous wife. Who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. And then it gives this beautiful description uh, starting in verse 11 of Proverbs 31 about the virtuous wife, the virtuous woman. Verse 26 says this about her. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And so uh, wisdom there uh, to listen to your mom and to uh, follow your mother's instruction as well as your father's instruction really for your own good. So back in Matthew 15, we look at this story of this woman pleading with Jesus for her daughter. Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went out from there, and he departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord Son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. Now, this was a Gentile woman, uh, as we're going to see here in the story. She was a woman from the land of Canaan. Uh, She was a woman from the region of Tyre and Sidon, which is modern-day Lebanon. So it was in a different, really a different nation, not in Israel, uh, outside of the borders of, of Israel at that time. So she was a woman who was outside the covenant of God. And remember that Jesus came for the household of Israel. When he came, he came as a Jewish savior. He came as a Jewish Messiah. He's a Jew. He came in fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. He came as the Jewish savior, the Jewish Messiah. Matter of fact, the early church was made up all of Jews. All the apostles were Jews. Uh, Everybody he handpicked was Jewish. Paul the apostle who became the disciple, I believe, who filled the role uh, of of Judas Iscariot was a Jew. He was an expert in the law. The early church primarily was almost entirely made up of Jewish people up until uh, really uh, 50 or, or, or 60 AD when the Jews had primarily, the nation of Israel had primarily rejected Jesus Christ. Those who got saved were saved. And then the gospel went to the whole Roman world. And then the, uh, the church became made up primarily of Gentiles. Although it was to the Jew first. And then also to the Gentiles. So she is outside the covenant of God at this time. She's, we're dealing with the old covenant. The new covenant had not started yet. And so if you weren't Jewish... Uh, and you weren't of the physical lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you were outside of the covenant. And, you know, you really uh, had to convert to Judaism and begin to follow and worship uh, uh, the God of Israel. And even then, you were not really accepted in that culture as a Gentile. You were not accepted uh, into the covenant of Israel at this time. And so this woman, she knows she's outside the covenant. She's not from Israel. 
and, and she, yet she knows that Jesus is the only one who can help her. She must have been at a point of total desperation. Her daughter is demon-possessed, which likely means that she was probably, uh, the daughter was practicing witchcraft or possibly worshiping other gods, which was, of course, prevalent at this time. And practicing witchcraft, worshiping idols, opens the door to the demonic realm in a way to where they can come into the door. You open the door to them, they come on in. And so at this point, she's probably gone to the shaman, she's gone to the, the priests of, uh, of the pagan temple, she's gone everywhere she can, uh, the witch doctors, whoever she can find, she's trying to get this demon out of her daughter, and there's no help, there's no hope, nobody is able to help her. So in desperation, she's heard of Jesus, she knows about this Jewish Messiah who's healing people, who's casting out demons, who's doing this great work of God in Israel, and here he is crossing her area or, or crossing where she is, and she just cries out to him for mercy. Notice that she doesn't come to him for justice. She doesn't want justice. She wants mercy because she knows that whatever it is, the daughter has probably opened the door, uh, and if the daughter got justice, she wouldn't be set free. So she cries out to Jesus for mercy. Have mercy on me, O Lord, Son of David, that was a messianic title for, for Jesus Christ, showing that she understood who he was. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Verse 23, but he answered her not a word. Very interesting that, that Jesus initially, he, he heard her, but he didn't respond to her. And his disciples came, and they urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries out, after us. So the disciples were bothered with this woman. No doubt she was following them. No doubt she was crying out out loud, maybe making a public spectacle of herself, making a scene. She wasn't worried about what people thought. She just knew that this is the man who can set my daughter free. And so she's pleading with him. And, and the disciples are bothered by her. And they're saying, Lord, just tell her to get her out of here. Get, send her away. She's, she's bugging us. And they thought that Jesus might be in agreement with them because Jesus didn't answer her initially. You notice he he was silent to her plea. So then Jesus says this in verse 24. He doesn't send her away. He doesn't, he doesn't tell her to leave. He doesn't ignore her. He says this. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so in essence, Jesus is apparently saying this to his disciples they want this woman to be sent away because they're bugged by her. She's right there. She thinks Jesus is ignoring her because he hasn't answered her directly. But he's actually speaking to her. He's basically saying, I'm here for the Jews. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Again, because he is a Jewish Messiah. The gospel goes to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And the Jews, those who received him, received him. And then the nation rejected him and then opened the door uh, for the Gentiles. You remember when Peter uh, was told, kill and eat. And the sheet came down. He had the vision of the sheet in the book of Acts. And uh, he says, I have never uh, eaten anything unclean. And God says, what, what God has called clean, let no man call unclean. And basically said, he's going to save the Gentiles now. He's opening the door to the salvation of the Gentiles, no longer just to the house of Israel. But at this time, Jesus was not to go outside of Israel with his message. And so he's saying this, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He is actually answering her. And then she says this in verse 25, she came and she worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. She's just throwing herself upon the mercy and grace of Jesus, even though she knows she's not a Jew, even though she knows she's outside of the covenant of Israel, even though she recognizes that Jesus did not come uh, initially for the Gentiles. He came for the Jews and he was sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But you notice here, number one, she came and she worshiped him and Jesus received her worship. So Jesus is God. If Jesus wasn't God, he would not have received the worship because only God can receive worship. Man is not allowed to receive worship. Angels are not allowed to receive worship. But Jesus would receive worship when people uh, would worship him. You remember uh, after Jesus was resurrected, doubting Thomas worshipped him after he realized that he had conquered death. And Jesus received and accepted that worship as God. So she's, she's showing great faith here. She's showing great tenacity. You know, she's, she's persevering. Uh, she is continuing to ask and to seek 
and to knock on behalf of her demon-possessed daughter. And she's basically saying to, to, to Jesus, Lord, I have no other hope. Help me. You're, you're my last hope here. Please. She's pleading with him. You have to just love her strength and her tenacity here uh, and not giving up hope and not just feeling like, well, he's not answering me. He's ignoring me. I guess I'm just going just, just gonna to go away. Verse 26, then he answered, Jesus answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. So now Jesus is answering her. Now he is speaking to her directly. Before he was speaking in her hearing to his disciples, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She came, she worships him. She, she pleads with him for help. And then he answers her and he says, it's not good to take the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs. Now, inside this uh, uh, culture, What's interesting is there's no curse words in the book of, uh, in, the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament. In Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, there is no curse words. So in essence, if a, an Orthodox Jew or somebody in Israel wants to curse, they have to use another language to curse. Like when you go to Israel, you'll hear them cursing in English, even though they speak Hebrew, because they don't have any curse words in Hebrew. There's no cuss words in the Bible. So in essence, the closest thing to a curse word that they had was dog. And they would say, you know, these Gentile dogs. And what they would talk about with that word dog is they would talk about the mangy, mongrel, pack dogs that are out there to, you know, tear anything to pieces and scavengers and dirty and mangy uh, and, 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 you know, rabid with rabies. And so it's this idea uh, of you're, you're, you're a dog, you're a dirty dog is what they used to call the Gentiles. And that was really the only curse word uh, that they had that they could use. And, and so there are different words in the Greek, which the New Testament was written in Greek and Aramaic. There are different words for dog. So when we read here that Jesus uh, is saying it's not good to take the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs, he's not talking about the curse word, the, the word that they would use uh, to curse the Gentiles, which was kuan, was the Hebrew word, kuan. And it really just meant a mongrel, like a, a pack animal. It's the word that Jesus used in Matthew 7, verse 6, when he said, do not give what is holy to the dogs. Uh, this is not that word. This is a different word. Because people go, well, that's really not nice of Jesus that he said, you know, that he's calling this woman a dog. It's not good to take the children's bread, throw it to the little dogs. That's an insult. No, it was a, it was a different word. The Greek word that Jesus used and what she, the woman is using also when she answers him is the word kunarion. And kunarion is another word for dog, which was really a term of endearment. This was the word that was used for your pet. This was the word that was used for your house dog. Literally, it means a little dog or a puppy. So this was the family dog. So you had the, the kuan, the, the, the dog that was a mongrel, that was a pack animal, that was wild and crazy. Uh, and, and it was a curse word uh, that they would use to, to curse their enemies. Uh, or the people they didn't like. And then there's this other word that is for the family pet, the little house pet, the puppy. And so uh, he's telling her when she's begging him for help. Remember, she's outside the covenant. She's not Jewish. She's not a Jew. And, and the, the new covenant really uh, hasn't been kicked off yet in, in, in the sense that Jesus hasn't died yet, been buried and risen again on the third day. And the, and the Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost. So it, this is still under the old covenant, which was to the house of Israel. Uh, and, and Jesus is telling her, it's not good to take the children's bread and, and to throw it to the puppies. You know, to take their food, literally is what he means, and to throw it to the puppies. And then she, in her, in her smart response here, really... She says, yes, Lord, but even the little puppies eat the scraps which fall from the master's table. And, and, you know, again, it's hard for us to understand a lot of these things culturally, but they didn't, you know, in this day, they, they, they didn't have utensils. They didn't have knives and forks and spoons. They ate with their hands, much like they do in, in, in many countries around the world. Uh, they, they don't have necessarily uh, plates and they don't have forks and spoons and knives 
They don't have napkins or paper towels or anything like that to clean their hands with. So what they would do when they would eat, it would be kind of like family-style dinner. All the food would be put on the table. Everybody would just grab their food and start to eat it. And if they wanted some bread, they'd grab bread and just rip it off with their hand and pass it to someone else. And they'd grab the loaf and rip the bread off with their hand. Uh, you'd just grab some of the, the food that was there and you would you know, take it and, and put it on your bread. Uh, you would take the meat and you would rip a, hunk, uh, a, a chunk off of, uh, of the meat and you would just eat it with your hands. And so what would happen is, you know, they would dip the bread into sauces that they had there, into, you know, different au jus or, or what have you. And so it was kind of a messy event. I mean, you would eat with no napkins, with no utensils, with your hands. So you would basically get the food all over you. So what they would do is they would take the bread, the bread that they would eat with, and at the end of their meal, they would take the bread and they would clean their hands and their face with the leftover scraps of bread. And that was their napkin. That's how they cleaned up after they ate. And they had their little puppies, their little house dogs there that were waiting at the table for the scraps. And so you would take that bread after you cleaned yourself off, that was your napkin, and you would toss it to the little puppies, and the little puppies would get to eat from the master's table. So this woman is sharp. She knows what she's saying. Jesus is saying, I can't give you the bread that is meant for the children of Israel. And she says, yes, but I'll just take the scraps that fall from the master's table. And she is doing this to intercede for her daughter. She is just continuing to persevere in prayer. She is going to prevail in prayer because she is going to pray and pray and pray until she gets her answer. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us in Luke, in chapter 18, we read this. We read this in verse 1 first before Jesus tells this parable about prayer. Then Jesus spoke a parable, Luke 18, verse 1, to them that men ought always to pray and to not lose heart. So persevering in prayer, praying and praying and praying until your prayer is answered or until you have the satisfaction that you know that God is going to answer your prayer and then you rest at that time. And this is specifically here uh, uh, in this story that we're looking at today in Matthew. It's specifically for moms interceding for their children. Uh, don't o o ever underestimate the power of prayer that a mom has for her children, even grown children, even children that are, you know, in their 50s and 60s. Uh, moms, keep praying for your kids. A mom has a direct line to God, I believe that, when it comes to intercessory prayer for her children. And Jesus gives them this parable here about praying. He says, men ought always to pray and to not lose heart. And then he gives them this parable in verse 2 of Luke 18. He says, there was a certain judge in a city who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me for my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And so Jesus is telling this parable about a wicked uh, judge, not a good judge, not a godly judge, not a righteous judge, just a, a corrupt, typical judge uh, who doesn't fear God and doesn't regard man. And this widow, who would really have had no standing in this culture, women had very little standing in this culture. It's Christianity that has brought equality to women all over the world. Everywhere Christianity has gone, uh, women's rights and women's uh, uh, equality has come because God says there's neither male nor female, uh, Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. We're all one in Christ. So uh, Christianity is the great equalizer, actually. Everywhere Christianity goes, women have their rights given to them. Where Christianity does not go, you have cultural norms that women are treated as second-class citizens all around the world in non-Christian nations. And, and yet here, this widow who has really no standing in the culture, because she just continues to harass this judge and to plead with this judge and to intercede with this judge for justice eventually the judge even though he's not a good guy he's not a righteous man he just gives her what she wants because she's bothering him like it's like i'll just give you whatever you want so you'll you'll go away and you'll leave me alone 
And Jesus says, if a, if a wicked man, if a wicked judge who's in power would do this for this widow who comes and just continues to come back and come back and come back and eventually he'll give her what she wants because he's bothered by her, he says, shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him though he bears long with him? In other words, God is a righteous God. God is a caring God. God is a loving God. And if a wicked man is going to help this widow because she's pleading with him, will not God avenge his own? Will he not answer your prayers? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, the Lord does answer our prayers. And it is important that we pray. Men always ought to pray and, uh, and pray without ceasing and cease not. We read in the book of James, in James chapter 5 about persevering in prayer. James 5.15, I'll read this to you. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective or effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And so this is uh, the idea. It's the idea of how to prevail in prayer. The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So basically, praying effectively is praying according to the word of God. Praying according to the word of God is praying according to the will of God. If you're praying for something that is against the word of God, God's not going to answer that prayer, and you really don't want him to answer that prayer. If you're asking God for something that is against his will for you, uh, you don't really want that in your life. And so, but if you are praying effectively, you're, you're praying biblically, you're praying scripturally, and you're praying fervently. And he gives the example of Elijah praying seven times until God answered his prayer. He prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and prayed until the, the answer came. And Elijah was just a man, he was a prophet, but he was just a man like you and I. Nothing special is what he's saying here. But he was, Elijah was praying biblically. Elijah was praying according to the will of God. And, and Elijah was praying determinedly, fervently. He was not giving up in his prayer. And so that's an example also for us to pray effectively, which means we want to pray according to the will of God, we want our prayers to be biblical, and fervently that we pray and we continue to pray, especially for our lost loved, lost loved ones, uh, until we get the answer. You've, I'm sure you've heard uh, the, the little uh, phrase, push, uh, which is pray until something happens, right? Push in prayer. You pray until something happens. You pray until you get either the peace of God or until the prayer is answered. In some prayers, you will pray for your whole life, for whatever it is, and, and, and may not even see the answer before you die. But you pray anyways in faith and trust that the Lord will answer your prayer if it's according to his will. As a matter of fact, Jesus teaches us this uh, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 9. Jesus says this, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock, and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So Jesus teaches us this. He teaches us to persevere in prayer. He tells us to ask and keep asking, to seek and to keep seeking, to knock and to keep knocking until you receive your answer. And that's what this woman was doing. This uh, Gentile woman who was outside of the covenant of Israel, she was prevailing in prayer. She was persevering in prayer. She was persisting in prayer. She was not going to give up until the Lord heard her and the Lord answered her. And so we read again back in Matthew chapter 15 after she had that uh, response to him, that quip back to him. Yes, Lord, even the little dogs, the little puppies eat the crumbs or the scraps which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, 
Matthew 15, 28, and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And so Jesus recognized this faith of this woman. She persevered. She was interceding. She was asking, not for herself, but for someone else, for her daughter who she loved. And, you know, that's, that's so often the key to prayer. When we're praying, if we're just praying selfishly and we're praying selfish prayers just for me, myself, and I, oftentimes, you know, we, we just have the wrong motives. Our motives are selfish. They're self-centered. They're narcissistic. Uh, and, and so a lot of times those prayers are, are, are not in the will of God. But when we are with a pure heart coming to God to intercede for our loved ones or to intercede for others, where there's no selfish interest, there's no self-serving reason that this mother is praying for her daughter, except she just wants to see her daughter whole. She wants us that if we pray, that he is going to answer our prayers. It's interesting that the only two times that Jesus uh, really marvels at anyone's faith uh, was here with this Gentile woman who was begging him to heal her daughter of this demon possession. And then the centurion, the Roman centurion who was a Roman soldier who was asking Jesus to heal his servant. And he says, uh, you don't even have to come into my house. I'm a man under authority. I know you're, uh, you're a man in authority. And he says, so just speak. Two times that Jesus, his own disciples, he would call them you men of prayer. He says, you will have your desire. Let it be to you as you desire. And you know, the whole, it seemed initially like he was ignoring her closely in the power uh, of Jesus Christ. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And then great multitudes, verse 30, came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the faith of this woman opened the door to all the people in this region to come to Jesus and to find healing there uh, in their lives. Maybe there is today perhaps someone here, uh, a mom who is praying for a child, a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. And I would just encourage you, mom, just continue to pray. Just continue to knock and ask and seek on your child's behalf before God. Even if it doesn't look good, even if it seems hopeless, many, many of us uh, are, are Christians today because we had people close to us who loved us interceding for us and praying for our salvation. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be saved. You know, and so it's God who removes the scales from the eyes. Uh, you know, people are born into this world blinded by the devil and, and they, they cannot see. They're in darkness. They're, they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And it's the prayers that we pray and intercede for our loved ones, especially a parent for a child, that the Lord really hears and answers those prayers and removes the scales from their eyes so that they would then come to know the Lord in a real way. So I encourage you today to continue to intercede for your lost children, for your, your, your prodigal son or your prodigal daughter or perhaps grandchildren. Follow this woman's example. Persevere in prayer. Make sure that your motives are pure. Pray biblically. Pray effectively because you're praying according to the will of God. And just push until something happens in prayer. Just continue to pray and trust that the Lord is hearing your prayers. And if he hears your prayers, he will answer. We read in John chapter 14, and this is where we, he says, Whatever you ask, in verse 7, By this my Father loved, and I abide in you. So the requirement, the prerequisite to being able to come to Jesus and know that whatever you're praying is going to be answered, your prayer in his name, he says, he promises he's going to answer your prayer, is that you are abiding in Christ and his words are abiding in you. So again, if you're praying against the word of God, you're praying against the will of God, and God is not going to answer that prayer. And really, you shouldn't want him to answer the prayer if it's against his will. But he says, if you keep my commandments and you uh, abide in my love, then these things will be done for you. And he says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command. Remember that Jesus is talking to his disciples here. He's not just talking to the general public. Uh, you have to be someone who's a disciple. And what is a disciple? Uh, it's not just a, a follower of Jesus, although it is that. It's one that takes up their cross. Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me and follow me, be my disciple, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and let him follow me. That's who this promise is to. To the one who is denying themselves, no longer selfish, no longer living for me, myself, and I, but really living to please God and to help God to accomplish what he wants to do through my life. 
So it's not selfish. I'm denying myself. I'm taking up my cross, which is self-denial and self-mortification, and following Jesus. And that is a true disciple, and that's the one who can come and seek, ask, and knock. And you have the promise, if that's you, that God is going to answer your prayers. Shall we pray? And Father, we do thank you for your promises to the moms here today, Lord, and really to all of us, Lord. This concept, Lord, this idea of how we persevere in prayer, so often it becomes so discouraging and disheartening when we pray and pray and pray, and it seems like you are silent. It seems like you're not listening, Lord, but help us to stand upon the promises of your word. Truly, you are never silent to us, Lord. We have your word to speak to our lives, Lord. We have your promises in your word that we can stand upon, Lord. The shield of faith to extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy, the sword of the spirit, uh, which is the word of God. And so I just pray, Father God, that you would encourage the moms here today, Lord, that you would encourage them with their wayward sons or daughters, Lord God, and that you would just assure them, Lord, that if they are followers of Jesus, if they are disciples of Jesus Christ, Lord, that whatever they are praying according to your will will be given to them, Lord, whether we see it in this lifetime or not. Help us to have the faith of this woman, Lord God, that was really outside the covenant, and yet she just did not give up until Jesus came and heard and answered her prayer and healed her daughter. And so, Father, for all of those who are uh, lost, all of those who are wandering, Lord, all of those who are uh, perhaps just out there in the world, Lord God, that we are praying for, we ask that you would do a work, Lord. You would save them, each one of them, each one of our loved ones from this wicked generation, Lord. You would bring them to yourself, Lord. Bring them into the covering, Lord, that you want to give to them, Father, the covering of a Father in heaven who loves them. Bless the moms today, Father. May you encourage them and strengthen them, Lord God, in their calling and position, the honorable position of being a mother, Lord. Bless them, we pray today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.